Good afternoon, everybody. Coming to you a little bit earlier than the evening like I normally do, just because, well, quite frankly, it is the Ides of March, and I am in the office now, and I, you know, I don't want to come back this evening for you guys. And there's plenty of news that has already occurred already today to talk about, because, of course, that's the world we live in. But one thing I do have to say starting off, you know, our videos get thousands of views. We're, we're now on Apple and, and Spotify, too, with the podcast. You can listen to this on the go if you want to. But, you know, we get thousands of views on Facebook of these things. And yet, you know what I don't get? Thousands of shares. What kind of person are you that you don't scroll on down to the bottom as I'm speaking and just hit that share button? Even if you hate me, share it out. Be like, look at this loser. You know, for all, I, I'm, I'm over here working away behind this desk for you guys, bringing you some hot takes from a true conservative, true liber, liberty-oriented perspective. Can't even hit the share button for me. What kind of person are you? Anyways, that being said, guys, share it out. As always, we we encourage you to support us. Go online, shop.broodco.com, B-R-E-W-E-D-C-O.com. Also, you can go to donate.broodco.com and donate to our efforts, and we'll talk about the cost bill here in a second. Um, you can also, you know, check out the shop in Lexington, buy coffee online. It's great coffee. It's real good coffee. I enjoy it quite a lot. But on to the news. So we've got a big bombshell support. Not surprising. Um, not exactly. Uh, I, I'm not surprised. Of course, I'm also not surprised because I know about some other things going on in the unemployment office that we'll see when they come to light. But one of the things that uh, not surprised to see that some people who needed unemployment been getting special treatment, especially when it came to Jacqueline Coleman. And, and you know, the reports to me, I'm told Jacqueline Coleman is a special kind of uh, terrible person that does not follow the law at all and does not um, treat things with the kind of way that you're expected to treat things as a as a government entity. But um, what we have here is the unemployment office with Jacqueline Coleman, it came out in some reporting on this that she was uh, a part of um, groups of people. So basically, if you knew Jacqueline or you knew Andy or you knew somebody in there, you could send them a message and be like, hey, my unemployment claim isn't getting handled. Can you handle it for me? And rather than throwing them into the, the, the pile with everybody else to wait their turn, Uh, They would go to the front of the line and be resolved sometimes in a matter of hours, which also begs begs the question, why is it so expensive for us to process these claims? Why does it take so long? We're going to be talking about how the unemployment system works here in a bit to maybe help explain that and and kind of cover some of that. But, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. I'm certainly not surprised. I'm certainly not alarmed. I mean, it was basically indicated to us when you had you had these websites and, and news sources like WDRB, I believe, and LEX18 and ABC36, where, you know, they'd go in, they would interview the governor, they would interview these people and be like, why are you such a screw up when it comes to unemployment? Why do we suck so bad? Why is Kentucky the worst in the country? Why do you suck, sir? And his response was, is I don't suck. Here, if you find anybody who's who's got issues with their unemployment, if you've got any issues there, uh, go ahead and just have them reach out to me. And so the defense for this coming out of the governor's office has been, well, that's just the same as we offered to everyone else to reach out to the news stations or anything else to get it handled. One thing I would definitely want to push back on that on is, what do you think the percentage of people who sent their uh, unemployment claim into these news sources for assistance for help. What percentage of them do you think actually got help? Versus what's the percentage of people that could text Jacqueline, and including, I guess, her hairdresser uh, is one of them, or text Andy or text uh, a number of these people and say, hey, uh, can you look at my unemployment claim? I bet, How much of them do you want to bet? You think, you think 100% of them, 100% of them, um, got resolved? Or do you think it's a similar percentage to the same amount of people that called into the news sites, right? I guess I guess it goes once again, it doesn't matter anything else but who you know when it comes to the Democratic Party of Kentucky, when it comes to Annie Bashir, because that is the I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Obvious because of the person who was in charge of unemployment had no experience, and it was 39-year-old 
Um, individual, he just committed suicide there. Um, Mac Mac Manera, Mac Manera, Mac Man, Mac Manera. Ugh, I don't know if I'm even saying that right, but that's his name, something like that. Anyway, so he uh, he had not a lot of experience in it, but yeah, he was in charge of unemployment. Why? Well, quite simply, he knocked a lot of doors for. Uh, Bashir there worked on his campaign. So, of course, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. And I guess in turn, in this case, they're scratching backs um, by letting other people go homeless and hungry while the people who, who do their hair, people who take care of them, uh, they take care of. In fact, I, I do want to draw a curious quote there. Um, one of the one of the quotes quoted text messages as was sent um, that they have in the article. As I talk about this doing her hair thing, it, it says quite simply. She said in one of her texts, um, "Let's see. One of the people who needs help does my hair, so we obviously need to take care of her." Followed up by a Modicon. Here are her messages and contact info. Well, let me ask you, Coleman, why was she filing for unemployment? Was it because at the time you weren't supposed to be getting your hair done? If you're sitting there saying, oh, we need to make sure she takes care of her because she does my hair, LOL. We weren't supposed to be getting our hair done, were we? We weren't supposed to be getting that done. Are you, are, are, are you saying, Coleman? That your hairdresser was secretly doing your hair still while you were helping her out with her unemployment claim? That's how I read it. I'm going to read that again there. I'm not saying I'm breaking the news here. Maybe somebody else has already thought about this. But I think it's worth asking asking Coleman, just like it's worth asking her a lot of questions. When she said that we need to take care of this unemployment claim because it's because the person who needs help does my hair, so we obviously need to take care of her emoticon. Here are her messages and contact info. I'll say that again. Are you stating to me, Coleman, once again, did Coleman admit in text that she needed to take care of her hairdresser because she'd jack up her hair when the rest of us were not allowed to get our locks trimmed up or were stuck doing it ourselves? Apparently, Coleman was getting that special, special treatment that happens because rule for thee, but not for me is in general, I guess the rules of the Bashir administration, I guess that's just how it operates. Right. I don't know about you guys, but I know that, uh, I believe it was actually supposed to be, was, was it illegal? It was somehow against the rules to have somebody come into your home and cut your hair at the same time. I believe it was, I don't know. I know that, uh, the person who did not come into my house and cut my hair, didn't need to do it on the secret and low because they were worried about their license being pulled because that person didn't come into my house and cut my hair secretly. That didn't happen. But of course, you know, when it comes to Coleman's hair, she's allowed to say it out loud. So there you go. The rest of us having to go to underground haircuts, but Coleman on the other hand can text the highest levels of government saying, Hey, I'm getting my hair cut when I'm not supposed to. Speaking of unemployment, uh, let's talk about what's going on with the unemployment. Let's talk about the unemployment system. And I think a lot of people don't understand what goes on, how unemployment works, why is it so messed up, uh, and what the issue is, and, and, and why Kentucky is one of the worst unemployment s states in, in the country. And, and to talk about a little bit of the fraud, a little bit of how the process works, and what it's like as an employer dealing with unemployment at this time. Because it's very, very interesting time to be an employer and deal with Unemployment. So, one the first uh, thing you have to understand was the first thing you have to understand was uh, how uh, what is unemployment supposed to be? So, unemployment is meant to be when a, a in individual gets laid off or doesn't have work anymore by no fault of their own, right? And what do we mean by that no fault of their own? Well, unemployment was meant to be a situation to catch you if you fall, and it's not your fault. So if you get fired, um, you know, you you get you get removed from from your job, you quit your job, you're not supposed to get unemployment because it's it is your fault you lost your job. So it's supposed to be no fault of your own. And because of that, if it's no fault of your own, generally speaking, that means it is somehow a mismanagement or fault of your employer. That's the thought process, right? Now, now that's kind of a very straightforward thought process. And I'm not saying they're saying 
Let's blame your employer. But that's the thought process is your employer needs to pay for it because for some reason, somehow it is not uh, your fault. And so when somebody files an unemployment claim, the employer gets a letter in the mail uh, saying this person filed for unemployment. They're saying they, they deserve their unemployment. If you would like to push back on that, you have to respond to this letter with an X amount of time, write down what your complaint is, and then an investigation ensues where they're supposed to be finding out what's going on. That's all well and good and a great system for normal times. However, it's not built for a time when we lay off over a million people at one time, but more importantly, at a time when employers did want to pay out their staff. They don't want to argue and fight with it. Now, anyone who, who talked to me about this issue or, or has asked me, well, what would you have done to fix it? You know, the first thing I would have done if I was – in, in office would have been to recognize because, you know, I would call in people who deal with unemployment claims, the employer, and, and I would call in the unemployment office. I'd say, what, what do we need to do? Because before I lay off million over a million people, I should maybe make sure we're prepared to make sure we take care of these people that I'm saying are, are, are not necessary. I'm saying that the sniffles is more of a threat to them than them not having a job would be. So maybe I should take care of them. So I'd sit down and I'd talk to them. And, and, and what an employer would have told them is say, hey, listen, you know, there's this whole process. What if when I lay off 20, 30 people as we had to do at one time, what if I just provided to the unemployment office a list, maybe with their, with their socials, with their names, right? And said, if these people come in claiming unemployment, I'm pre-approving them. I'm saying, give them the old rubber stamp. They're approved. Not only would that get the claims process faster, because we wouldn't have the 10-day minimum waiting period for you to get your unemployment waiting for employers to respond. But as well, that would leave more time to deal with this other issue. And this other issue is the fraud amongst the unemployment system. There is a lot of fraud. Why is there fraud? Because there's going to be fraud anytime the government's just handing out cash. Anytime somebody's just handing out money, handing out cash, helicoptering it around, remember state auditor Harmon found that uh, they broke federal law by auto approving and auto dispersing unemployment claims. So anytime you have a government entity just helicoptering out, putting out cash, and we saw this with PPP loans, EIDL loans, we've seen this with unemployment, you're going to have fraud happen. It's quite simple. Why? Because, yeah, it's easy money. I file a little thing. I might get it. I might not. If I don't get it, eh. I didn't get it. Nothing happens to me. If I do get it, hey, that's free money, right? So, of course, you're going to have a lot of fraud. And, and, and to tell you this kind of fraud, I'm going to tell you as an employer, I have received unemployment claims for people that have never worked for me. Never worked for me. We've had people claiming unemployment saying things like, um, oh, this was b before any companies had closed. Oh, companies closed. Well, I know we're still operating, right? We're still operating or, or names. We don't know. We don't recognize that name. We, we search our, 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 our records. No name. It's not even coming up, right? Individuals that we fired because they were showing up late filing for unemployment. Individuals who um, decided to quit, move on. Individuals that, you know, quit maybe for school and... Uh, worked for us and, and is now applying for unemployment. Individuals that worked for us less time than they're getting approved for their unemployment for. And this fraud occurs. And under normal circumstance, we'd be able to argue it. However, there's so many issues going on, we don't even get the letters to argue when there is fraud until 12 days out. From, from when they were supposed to, our deadline, we had a 10-day deadline from this date to respond. We're get, not getting the letter till it's, 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 it's two days past that deadline. Because the system is so messed up. Because at the time, especially the mail system was running so behind because of the overages of people and everything else. Because of the level of claims, because you decide to throw 1.2 million people out of a job. So instead of having an auto-approved list to just kind of move those people to the side, and now we can focus on these people who are not auto-approved because I had to lay off people. I didn't want them going without their unemployment. I, I, I want them taken care of. It's not their fault, right? 
But, but you know, one of the reasons why the fraud's such an issue, you'd be like, oh, it's just money, it's just money. You have to understand about unemployment, that is not the government's money at all. That's not even technically tax money. That is a special percentage of an employer, me, right, as an employer, if I employ, let's say I employ 30 people right now, right? A percentage of my payroll every two weeks that we cut a check goes into this unemployment fund. And that percentage is based upon the amount of unemployment claims I as an individual have had, the amount of money in the fund at the time as a whole, and my risk for future unemployment claims. And it ranges. It can range, I believe, and somebody can correct me, from 0.1% all the way up to 10% of payroll. And so that money is not just tax dollars. Literally, that is coming directly from us employers. And so when there's fraud with this money, when that is, and, and you know, all tax money is our money. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, but understand where unemployment comes from. So when fraud occurs, the, who has to pay it back? So when I had these claims from people, I don't even know that we have never been employed from us getting approved and that money is now coming out of my coffers that makes my unemployment rates go up these people are stealing directly from the employers not through the government and then through the government to everyone and that fraud and and the problems are is that fraud does occur and in order to fight back we then create situations that delay the processing of other things such as uh, uh, whether it's loans, PPP loans, EADL loans to employers when other people were committing fraud or whether that is your unemployment claims. So if there's a way to rubber stamp the easy ones we know are true, and then if there's a way to, then t that gives us more time now to investigate the ones that aren't. Right? Let's look at the best of people, but we didn't set that up. And that creates the unemployment problems. And I can tell you this much right, right here. My wife is the one who responds to these unemployment complaints, and she throws a fit. She was just throwing a fit about this the other day. She was getting all upset about it because she is like, oh, my gosh, these people worked for us for two weeks. These people didn't work for us at all. These people were fired for stealing, possibly. These people... We're, we're, we're left the job for school or le whatever they may be. And we're getting inundated with them. And then they, they respond and they take and, and, and it just comes out. I mean, take one of the people that we, we sort of laid off. We said, hey, we got to lay off. And it was like a day she's laid off. And then we called her back and said, never mind. We got any day with, this was that brood. <laughs> we got any day with business. Come on back. She said, no, I don't want to come back. She had the ability to work again. And so she decided to say, no, I don't want to come back. Now this individual out of my unemployment fund can take $3,500 out max. Getting paid six months of unemployment that only worked there three, four months. Twice as long. What is the reason at that point to get a job? What is the reason? And then we have the Democrats federally voting to extend out these unemployment benefits, not voting to, not voting to help out small businesses that just want to get back open and can provide new jobs for those people to go to. And what does that deal with? That deals with this idea that we hear now. Bashir, he's had that talking point for a little while. Now we're hearing it federally called Build Back Better. We're going to build back better. Remember, guys, I, the other day I was talking about this idea and, and, and the big difference I'm finding between myself and a lot of other individuals that pay attention to what's going on in government that doesn't think the same way is this belief that government isn't here to solve our problems. Right? Government doesn't exist to solve problems. That isn't their job. Their job is simple, is to make sure that my rights to life, liberty, and property are maintained to the point that I don't grab it from somebody else. They exist to make sure that the, the laws based upon, uh, based upon that exist and are followed. And they exist in some circumstances like roads where there is definitely a private factor way that doesn't involve government to do roads that maybe one day I'll go down a long rabbit hole with you guys on. But they can exist to do roads. 
We don't even need a state government to do schooling. In fact, for those who don't realize, I believe the uh, federal um, Department of Education um, was actually founded in the, let's see here, I believe it was the 80s. Let me check again. Uh, yep, was was um, Department of Education, sorry, was founded in, let's see here, 1980, exactly, 1980. Most of the people making our laws now, most of the people who are our, uh, law lawmakers, right? Mitch McConnell, for an example, right? They didn't even go to school when the Federal Department of Education existed. Yet here they are deciding that they need to create it. They need to create a department to solve problems. That is not government's role to solve problems. It is not government's role to solve problems because government doesn't make anything. They don't produce anything. They're not producers. They take. They take from you. They take from me. Right? They don't get to take my money and decide they're going to go solve problems with. And there's a lot of people even on the right that believe government exists to solve problems. One of the things we're talking about about this build back better shenanigans we're hearing about federal government and Andy Bashir's talking about with his billion dollar and rainy day fund. One of the things they talk about, and rightly so, is is you know how to help out Eastern Kentucky. Rightly so. Rightly so. Eastern Kentucky needs help. But what they failed to mention is the two things that occurred to make Eastern Kentucky need help, right? Because towns a, a form when there was economic center. So if we go way back to before towns this town was ever founded, okay? People come into an area for an economic reason, right? So they come in because of um, distilleries around, or they come in, uh, I believe there's a place in Kentucky that is like the banana capital of the world or something because uh, back before refrigeration was there, it was a good point where you could dig down low and store bananas in the cold, like crazy things like that. But that people build up towns around economic centers where you're doing something. So in Eastern Kentucky, they built up these towns and these lives around coal, around coal mining. And what happened was, and they don't want to talk about this, is the, the coal industry, a, a law passed, um, which actually Mr. McConnell voted for, um, called the uh, Clean... Clean Coal uh, Act, or uh, I'm sorry, the Clean Coal Act, I believe it was called. Let's see here. Clean Coal Act. That's right. Surprisingly, the Clean Coal Act, um, there's more. There's other clean coal. Uh, I'm sorry, that was the Act of 27. Um, there's been several coal acts. But the initial one that dealt with uh, a dirty coal and clean coal actually came out of uh, a, a senator that proposed it uh, was the state that suddenly got all our coal business. Uh, I believe that was Wyoming. I could be wrong, but somewhere out west. And what that coal act do? Well, what that coal act did is it was an EPA act saying that these coal fire plants, the air coming out of it, had to be below this level of, of, of content of, of dirty coal. And so it left these power plants to have two choices. You could either get Kentucky coal and buy scrubbers, or you can get coal from uh, this that western state, I believe Wyoming, that was coming out and it was it was a clean coal, so it didn't need scrubbers. So if the coal costs the same, and if you buy coal from here and need scrubbers, and you buy coal from here and it's clean, clean, what do you where are you gonna purchase from? Right. Naturally, the profit incentive, a fake profit incentive created by the government's clean air acts is to go to these other states and buy this coal. Naturally, killing the coal industry in eastern Kentucky. But a part of that was the coal severance money. So they knew they were removing coal that yeah, uh, somebody just asked. Yes, uh, Obama did have a clean coal act too, um, and there's a few more before that in the '90s actually. Anyway, so 
they they knew, or I believe early 2000s, sorry. They knew that this was going to kill the Eastern Kentucky coal industry. Knowing that, they created the Coal Severance Fund. Money to go to Kentucky to help these communities rebuild. This money, to give you some idea of what the uh, coal severance money um, for Kentucky was spent on, um, to give you an idea, I, I believe some that they were spent on things like little league teams. They were spent on things like you know um, fifty thousand here, ten thousand here, all these things that help you get elected, but don't actually solve the problems of Eastern Kentucky. In fact, you have counties like I don't know. You have some counties getting funds that didn't need it. I believe, uh, I believe, could be wrong, once again, that coal severance money went to paying for the UK scoreboard at Rupp Arena. And so that's what these monies got spent on. These little works here, these little works here, and it didn't get actually spent to create what it should have been done, which is to create, you need to create a, a highway line, a rail line, um, you know, you needed to get these, these towns, these communities connected in so industry can grow because one of the reasons why Eastern Kentucky hasn't seen industry grow, one of the biggest reasons why is because there's no highways there. So if I'm a big factory, if I'm a big company and I'm trying to truck in, um, truck in things, and I'm trying to ship things out. I want to be off a major highway, and I can't do that if there's not a major highway. That's one of the big problems with Eastern Kentucky. They they have been missed by a complete entire highway system. It's a big story, um, you know. If you compare our Appalachia to some other areas that were relying upon coal, they got this coal severance money that then built in these highways, like what I'm talking about. You see a tale of two different towns, two different areas, right? One's got a lot of economic uh, um, gleaming to it, one doesn't. And my point of saying that, going back to does government solve problems, that's a perfect example of government first creating a problem through regulation that has been felt for generations. And, and one would have to ask the question, how much damage did that coal be doing to the environment compared to how much damage has it done to the economic centers of these coal towns? Of these people how many thousands of lives and generations have been affected and will be continue to be effective how many things like drugs coming into an area causing overdoses and things like that all ramifications of that decision remember mcconnell voted for that all ramifications of that decision will be felt for generations how much damage does that do compared to these feel-good acts of the clean air act however the thing is is you know, that gets you elected, right? It sounds good, so it gets me elected. And, and, and government's here to solve your problem, so that's what they need to be doing. And then, to make it worse, to throw salt in that wound, they turn around and spend the coal severance money not accomplishing a single thing to actually do long-term help to these areas. They didn't invest in broadband they didn't invest in internet. They didn't invest in highways. They didn't invest in, 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 in this infrastructure they need to invest in. And they did little things here or there that helped them get elected because, once again, government does not solve problems. They're a necessary evil. They do not solve problems. Stop looking at them to solve problems. If you're looking at an area and you say, man, I need to get businesses into an area, most of the time what you're going to find is government's the reason why an economic area isn't thriving. Evidenced by the fact that government will cut special tax breaks for businesses to come into an area. Why are they cutting those special tax breaks? Well, because their regulations, their tax codes, is the thing stopping business from coming into an area anyways. They're a barrier to issues. They are not solving problems. They don't do that. They create problems that then they ask you for more money from. <laughs> they need more money from you to then solve. They create the problem. They then come to you for more money to solve it. Government doesn't solve problems. Stop asking them to build back better. I don't want the government to build anything. I want you to shrink. Let us build back better. How about you stop taking more money out of our pockets? Let us build it.
Leave us alone. In that same way, we want to talk about our cost bill. We've been getting a lot of questions, a lot of confusions um, about, about the impeachment cost bill. So, yes, we did get passed on impeachment cost bill. And by us, I mean myself, Jacob Clark, and Tony Wheatley. There was a fourth petitioner. He is on the hook for uh, supposedly uh, um, one-fourth of 80%. To tell you about who this petitioner is, it's, it's a gentleman um, who withdrew off the petition um, stating that he believes the governor can break the Constitution. This individual withdrew off the, con- the, the, the petition not because uh, he necessarily believes that as – he will say time and time again, because he's now the chair of the Libertarian Party for the state, he doesn't actually think the governor can break the Constitution. No, he made those statements, signed and notarized statements, because he wanted to remove himself off the petition because he was worried about the cost bill coming down. He was worried about getting hit with the cost. He was worried. Um, he didn't feel like he had enough, he's called control in the situation. Um Whatever that meant, there's not much to, to tell you guys. Between me and the petitioners, we communicate a little bit. We talk to each other, of course, but there's not like a lot of – there's like two times we had to make decisions and draft up documents and then say, do you agree? Do you like this? What do you want to change? Right? There wasn't a lot. But this, this, this guy, he withdrew off the impeachment petition, and in doing so, he sent a, a, um, a little bit of a bootlicky letter to the governor and to the impeachment committee. Um, because he's trying to absolve himself of costs. He was hoping, and in fact, when the governor sent the cost bill, he wanted only the cost bill to go to the three active petitioners. The, the, the boot licking, the boot kissing of, of this individual uh, made it to where the governor said, I don't want to pass on the cost to him, but I think the impeachment committee still pass off on the cost to him anyways. And when people want to sit there and talk to me about the Libertarian Party, they're talking about the Libertarian Party. Parties aren't the answer. You need to hold people accountable. By obvious example, um, by obvious example that he, uh, uh, this this gentleman, after he did all these things, after he, he literally folded in on his principles to avoid a cost bill um, because he was worried about me what the costs are, and that's okay, I guess. If you're worried about the costs, and, and everything else you want to fold in on your principles, that's something you can do. That's fine. But then after doing that, the Libertarian Party of Kentucky turned around and voted him in as chair. Now, they can choose to do that. That's politics over principles. The Libertarian Party claims to be the party of principles. They just put politics over principle. But they can do that. That's okay. Um, I mean, I disagree with it. I'm not in the Libertarian Party. I disagree with it. I, I'm very disappointed at some of the... Um, Oops, I'm very disappointed at some of the some of the things I've been seeing out of the Libertarian Party regarding this. But, um, you know, hey, that's what he wanted to do. That's what he did. But the Libertarian Party of Kentucky turns around and votes him in his chair for doing that. Um, and all that proves to me is that a, a party to all you people who think, oh, it's the duopoly and the third party is the issue. Listen, your party, no matter the party, it's going to fold in on itself too. It won't stand for what it says it does unless people in the party hold them accountable. The Republican Party is the party of the Constitution. I agree with the Republican Party platform. I will hold people accountable to the Republican Party platform, and that's what I will do. On the other side of that, so talking about the impeachment costs, the three of us are the ones who, when we're talking about the impeachment costs and everything else, that's that's what we're dealing with, is is myself, Jacob Clark, and Tony Wheatley, all three registered Republicans. So if people try to tell you the Republican Party didn't want to impeach Bashir, uh, the Republican Party establishment in it, it was Republicans who brought the, the um, order to them, well, majority of Republicans that brought the order to them, and... Um, Republicans trying to hold Republican Party accountable. Just remember that. Anyway, so this this cost bill gets sent on. So eighteen thousand. So we got hit with a forty two thousand four hundred and forty four dollar and five cent cost bill, which leads me to wonder. I made this joke earlier. How do you split five cents between three people? But um, they sent us this cost bill, and we do have the ability to object to the cost bill, which we will. That's due tomorrow. And and there is some constitutional uh, questions. Which, you know, it's the Ides of March. We'll see what happens. Um, but the governor only passed on an eighteen thousand dollar cost bill. Obviously, overblown if you look at it. 
Um, you can't account properly for hours, everything else like that. And, and like I said, in our response, we'll deal with that. And I'll post the response for you guys to see how we respond to the cost bill. But the impeachment committee then tacked on an additional um, – I tacked on the additional money to get to $42,444.05. And that additional money wasn't even the committee's time. They're charging us for things like KSP being there and the LRC secretary. You know, keep in mind, they're all paid salaries. They'd be there anyways. But, of course, they're trying to charge us for these things. Now, the impeachment committee claims that they're passing this on uh, because simply state statute requires them to do so. This has never happened before when impeachment costs got pushed on. Keep in mind, we got pushed to 44000 for Annie Bashir, but the Daniel Cameron uh, people only got a cost bill for about 8000 9000 and the Go Forth petition only got a, a cost bill for 12000 We got one for forty four. Why is that? Well, it's got a lot to do with the fact that the GOP establishment is trying to penalize us for trying to hold them accountable, for asking them to hold the governor accountable. They want to penalize us because we've created a bad situation for them where people are waking up and realizing that the establishment is a problem here in Kentucky. And if you want real liberty, you want real freedom, we need to start paying attention, working in primaries, and getting people in there. And they don't like it. They don't like that I talk about this. They don't like the fact that we're holding an event on April 17th uh, to – and check that out on Vent Bright on our Facebook. They don't like the fact we're doing those things to systematically work these people out and get in our own people to hold them accountable that will fight for liberty, that will fight for things like getting rid of your income tax, that will fight for things like ending abortion, that will fight for things like uh, creating gun sanctuary states. The, that's what the kinds of things we want them to fight for. School choice. Things we want them to fight for. All good actual conservative policies that actually help people but they don't want us to do that they want us to be held accountable for the cost bill so they're passing that on to us and you can help out with that if you want to donate donate.broodco.com and any monies if if we do end up somehow some way not uh, raising more money than we owe we will donate all that to Kentucky Liberty a, a, a nonprofit um, that does deal exactly what we're talking about uh, that deals in a little bit of electioneering, but uh, a lot of um, these, these uh, a little bit to an issue advocacy and basically working on holding these people accountable. It's a fantastic nonprofit. It's new. And to be quite honest, I do. Um, it doesn't pay me anything, of course, but I do do some work on it. Anyway, so that's what's going on with the cost bill. A lot of people ask us about. Now, as well, we hear at federal level them talking a little bit about a wealth tax. I just want to take a second to explain the wealth tax and, and how incredibly stupid it is because they're talking about raising taxes in general um, because they've got, you know, oh, you know, you got climate change, you got all this. Once again, government needs to solve your problems. We got you guys hooked. We gave you that little hit of, uh, hit of, hit of um, government money, of government solving issues for you. And you're going to turn to us and keep asking, so we need more money from you. Because once again, the problems we created by closing down the economy, we want you to give us more money to solve the problems we're creating. And so in doing so, there's been some talk about a wealth tax. What a wealth tax is is an idea that somebody comes in and they'll assess your, your value, your, your, your net worth, and, and tax you at 2% if your net worth is above $50 million. The, a wealth tax is the kind of tax and policy and the kind of thing people support that are economically stupid. They have no concept of monetary information. In fact, the reason why they're pushing for it and, and, and if they are poor, it's that mind and thought process of things like I don't even understand what wealth is is probably one of the things holding them back. So to explain this, so let's talk about 50 million. How do you get to be worth 50 million, right? So, you know, as a lot of you know, before COVID started, I was worth several million dollars. I don't know where I'm at now. I haven't bothered to look. I've lost a lot of money um, because we of businesses getting closed down, businesses being lost, things like that. But when I say, oh, I was worth several million dollars, a lot of people think, oh, you had millions of dollars in the bank. No, I do not. You're economically, you, you, are, you are financially illiterate if you think that's what it is. It's very easy, actually, for business owners to be millionaires. Quite simply put, uh, a business is worth uh, a lot of times three times gross 
uh, is, is a simple formula a lot of people use. So if your business is doing, um, I don't know, $100,000 in business a year, three times gross, your business is worth $300,000. That's a very simple, easy formula. There's a lot more that goes into it that talks about your fixed assets and liabilities. And I, I'm not going to go into that. But let's just take that easy formula of three times gross. It can also be five times profit. It, it just depends on the industry, but we'll, we'll do three times gross. And, and all you people who are out there like screaming, like that's oversimplified. I know it is, but for our conversation and for our point, I'm going to use it. And so three times gross. So if you make, if, if, if your business does, let's say $50,000 a month in revenue, it does $600,000 a year times three, your business is worth 1.8 million. So if, if we set the wealth tax at 2% at 50 million, using that same thought process, um, that would put your business needing to do a gross um, amount of 1.4 million a month in business or 16.67 million a year. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, that's pretty significant, right? I mean, a, a 2% wealth tax would be a $2 million tax a year. You're making $16.7 million. You could easily afford that. Well, no, it's not what I said. I said I, I, that's your gross revenue. So $16.7 million, it's very easy to make maybe a 10% profit off of a business if you're lucky, if you're lucky, sometimes a five, 10 percent profit is pretty, pretty high sometimes. Depends on your type of business, and I hear you. But a 10 percent profit on 16.7 million or a 50 million dollar business is 1.67 million. How much was that two percent wealth tax again? How much was it? Oh, that's right. It was two million dollars. With a 2% wealth tax, if my business is assessed to be worth $50 million, I would owe a tax of $330,000 more than the money I earn off that business that you're, you're calculating my wealth off of. See, that's the thing. People don't understand the difference between income and wealth. People hear that, ah, oh, Jeff Bezos is worth billions. He doesn't have billions in the bank. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And on top of that, a 2% wealth tax, that would take out a lot of things. That would take out a lot of things, such as, uh, let's take, for example, stock trading. Right? 2% wealth tax. Why would I want to own, uh, I believe, Amazon stock doesn't pay out dividends. I could be mistaken. Somebody let me know. But Amazon stock, stock doesn't pay out dividends. It's weird a little bit, but it doesn't. But yet, an Amazon share right now is trading at, let's see here, stock value. Amazon share right now is trading at $3,081.68. So per share of Amazon, it would cost me, because they don't pay out dividends, it would cost me $61.64 a year just to hold on to it. I'm not even making anything off of that. As Warren Buffett said, people asked him, how much money did you lose during the, the, the recession? He said, nothing. I didn't sell it. I didn't realize a loss. You don't realize that money. You don't get that money until you sell that item. But your net worth is calculated based on all the things you own. Quite simply put, hopefully that helps people understand, uh, the idea of a wealth tax is simply a taxing policy of a financially illiterate individual or by a person who's obviously manipulating individuals who are financially illiterate to vote for them by saying, if I just had more of these rich people's money, I can solve more of your problems, ignoring the fact it's the same policies, the same entity you're asking to solve your issue once again is the one who created it. That's all I have for today's episode fresh brew kentucky politics as far as it goes remember to share it once again i swear 
if I see several hundred views and not, I'm sorry, several thousand views and not at least 30 shares, I'm going to be very mad at you guys, very upset. Just joking, guys. Thanks for listening at least. Check us out. Feel free to donate. Donate.broodco.com. Go online, broodco.com to shop, B-R-E-W-E-D-C-O.com. Come by the coffee shop in Lexington. Check us out. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful day.